Good morning. Okay, hello and welcome to the February 14th, 2024 Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. Um, we have Dave Zomek and Aaron present as staff and let's see if we have, um, no, I don't see our commissioners in the waiting room. Okay, so we have Laura, Bruce, Jason, myself, and maybe we'll just give them a minute. Okay, well, while we're waiting, I'll just announce our continuances. Um, if you are here for um, Pure Sky on behalf of WD Coles, that will be continued tonight. SWCA on behalf of UMass um, for Lot 13, that will be continued tonight. Wetland Wendell Services uh, likely continue tonight. This is um, Levitt Road, 260 Levitt Road. The NOI for Tetra Tech, we're going to do that one tonight. Um, Stonefield Engineering and Design, LLC on behalf of Valley Community Development or Ball Lane will also be continued tonight. Hi, Alex, welcome. Did you have trouble getting in? No, I was taking a nap. Oh. <laughs> Good prep time. Hopefully you won't need it for this yeah, one. We went out for a Valentine's dinner and I laid down when we got home. <laughs> okay, welcome. So we now have Alex. Um, I don't see Andre. Okay, I'll just keep. I think I'll just keep going on. Uh, Aaron, unless you've gotten some word from him that we need to usher him in somehow. You're on mute. No word from Andre yet. Okay. Okay. Um, Chair's report. Um, my only comment is that we reached out to town councilor. They reached out to us regarding a town council liaison, and we've been in communication with that. It looks like we might have Anna Gabella. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anna Devlin Gauthier. <laughs> As our liaison, um, that's not established completely yet. Anna served on CONCOM before she was elected to town council. So um, I, I served with her and so did Laura. Um, she's great. We look forward to talking with her more about that. Um, that's it. And I'll hand it over to Dave. Oh, go ahead, Bruce. <clears throat> Is this an appropriate? Can you comment on the interviews? Oh, we will be having interviews for our two seats um, on February 26th. So I don't know how many applicants we have to fill two seats on the Conservation Commission, but those are scheduled um, for a few hours on the 26th coming up. And if David and Aaron has more to say, I'll hand it over to so you that day. There's been a, been a strong response, Bruce. So I think we're we're doing five to seven of those, I think I'm in one day, back to back to back to back. So yeah, I'll be in those with Michelle, Aaron, and um, there's a member of the committee and I'm not gonna get the name of the committee, the Community Participation Committee, or I'm blanking on the official name of the committee and they sit in on those as well. So, um, so those will happen on Feb 26. So yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so uh, what time is your first hearing? Do you need a lot of updates, Michelle, or do you want me to go very quickly? You tell Our me. first hearing is at 7.30, so you have time, Dave. Okay. Um, again, no, nice, Andre. Always, always happy to take questions um, if there are any out there. So um, <laughs> this winter, if, we, if we're calling this a winter, uh, Brad and, and Anthony have been spending a lot of time maintaining uh, equipment. They've got a lot of things in the shop. This is a time to, to um, you know, change oil and lubricate uh, mowers and and brush hogs and and all sorts of things. Uh, we've also been doing a fair bit of um, kind of mild winter early successional habitat mowing. You may have seen Brad and Anthony around places on Bay Road, um, Bay Road, the back part of Station Road, uh, those kinds of areas that um, uh, have been mowed. Um, what else is going on? Um, we, I think 
Aaron, may, we may have reported last meeting on uh, the fact that we submitted that DCR Trails grant. Uh, Aaron put a lot of time into that, uh, very concentrated time, um, somewhat near the deadline, as is often the case with grants, uh, no fault of our own. Uh, but uh, we put in a grant for about $110,000. Um, and Aaron, you know, I know you haven't had time, but happy to have you share that with the commission via email and send that out uh, to them, the narrative, $110,000 for uh, basically additional money to connect the trails at Hickory Ridge. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a quick update on the Hickory Ridge trails in a minute, but you know, we don't have enough money to to connect all of those trails. And it seemed like the DCR trails grant was an opportunity to do that. We haven't had one of those uh, those grants. We haven't sought one of those in, in quite a number of years. So we thought Hickory was a pretty compelling project uh, for that. Uh, sticking with Hickory for a minute, uh, we we I think I reported the bids were just coming in at your last meeting. So we we do have the bids in. We are in the process of contracting for that work. I can't go into detail as to who has been selected, but uh, we are finalizing the selection of the contractor to build the two sections of trails at Hickory. Uh, one will be that ADA loop trail, which is kind of out near the clubhouse on the south side of the, uh, of the river, as you know, because it was permitted through the commission. And then the same contractor uh, also, as part of that bid, bid on the uh, north-south uh, trail all the way up to the uh, northern uh, edge of the property. So um, the good news is bids were competitive. We had a robust response. And um, again, weather, all weather dependent, we'll be finalizing contracts and then the project schedule will be based on, you know, uh, uh, weather conditions later this spring. We are under pretty pretty tight timeline to get that work done by the end of June. So um, Mother Nature is going to be either friend or foe this spring for those for those uh, grant grant awards. So um, that'll be about on the order of five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars worth of trail work um, that that uh, was permitted through the commission and we went through the the zoning board of appeals, uh, the the DAC. The design review board and and many other committees and boards so it's exciting to finally get that work going and then if we were to get the dcr trails grant that work would not happen until the summer of 25 because we would not hear about that grant until the fall and the only other update i had um and um you do know you know michelle is your cpa uh liaison and um, the CPA proposals are all coming as a package to the Finance Committee, and then the, the Town Council will take them up in the very near future. Uh, recall that we have $80,000 in requests in um, under that uh, CPA, um, CPA request. And, you know, I have every confidence that that, that proposal will stand the test of time and and get uh, supported by the Council. I hope they'll support it. And then that money will be available uh, after July 1 of 24. So again, the goal is to, you know, get as much funding from outside town and inside town as possible and line up uh, both uh, town staff to do some of these projects, but also augment our small town staff with volunteers and, and contractors where, where applicable, so uh, where possible. So, so it's going to be an exciting two summers of, of trail work. I think you'll see a lot of progress out there. Um, so that's kind of the quick updates around town. Any questions or about any of those projects or anything else you you might want to ask me while you have me here before your hearings begin? Uh, Jason. I just had a general question about that. Uh, it was the OSRP survey. Oh, yes. Um, I yeah. know that was just sent out and... Um, I, I'm just curious, one, who ultimately does that go to? It looked like it came from planning. Mm -hmm. And then does anybody have any idea like what the responses were in the past and what kind of like anticipated response for this year? And how often does this actually go out? So Aaron can give you, a, a, I'm sure, a little more updated information on kind of the survey. Um, but just to give you an idea, um, 
typically municipalities are required to do those every five to seven years. The state has kind of um, uh, fluctuated a little bit on that. You're, you're, you're mandated to do a, an update, I think every five years, and sometimes they've moved it to seven. Um, uh, that allows any city or town to be eligible for state grants uh, in recreation as well as conservation. Um, we have not done this format before, Jason, in answer to your question. So in years past, uh, this was pre long pre-COVID. Most of the meetings we had uh, were in person on the open space and recreation plan update. Uh, most of the surveys were paper back then, even seven years ago. Um, so we're doing this engage Amherst uh, approach, and Aaron can say a little bit more about that. I do know that the response, I think it was posted, was it last Friday, Aaron, was the first day it went out or the Friday before that? And I think I think even in day one, there was a pretty robust response to the online survey. Um, it's coordinated. It comes out of the planning department, but Aaron is very much, you know, I've been going to some of the meetings. Aaron has been right in the thick of things uh, uh, from day one with the planning department. We work very closely together. So I don't know if, Aaron, you want to say a little bit more about the, the the profile of how that moves forward. Yeah, maybe just to find it for the public. Um, so we're not just using oh, acronyms. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. Yeah, so um, what Dave's been referring to is the update of the town's open space and recreation plan. Um, so um, again, you know, previously it's been, I believe all paper um, surveys primarily and um, I think that, you know, they sort of range between like three to 500 responses are typically what you get. But again, with a online um, format, we're hopeful that we're going to get a robust ro response and, you know, a combination of um, digital responses and probably hard copy responses as well. Um, so the, the response the digital responses that come in are all tallied in in the um, engage Amherst format and so we're able to sort of extract all different kind of metrics from the data that we collect and you know ultimately the data that we collect is used to um, gauge what the needs of the needs and desires of the um, people who use Amherst um, recreation and open spaces are. Um, so where they want to see improvements, where they want to see land acquisitions or not, um, where they want to see new recreation areas or improvement of existing recreation areas. Um, and, and also, um, it's how we so there's a group that was formed, which is multiple departments in town that have been meeting since last, I think, October, November. Um, we've been meeting once or twice a month basically to get this off the ground and we use the survey basically to to direct our action items as part of the open space and recreation plan so um, it, it helps us to formulate sort of what the plan is for the next five to seven years for grant application purposes uh, so that you know um, you know, anything from trails to, to land grants to park grants and, and all of the above sort of give us a, a sense of what the town wants us to do. And, and that's how we use it to harness that information to direct us. I, I Just one other follow up, I would say that, you know, we fully expect a lot of feedback on things like trail conditions, uh, Puffer's Pond, you know, even the simplest of things, you know, Aaron and I have been talking about improvements to trails recently, you know, why don't we have more benches along trails? People love to linger at certain overlooks, uh, view sheds, uh, a beautiful bend in a river, wh wherever it might be, uh, but we don't have many benches. We don't have any picnic tables, you know, so we'll get all of that kind of feedback in 2024, and then that will help us with your help and with the help of the Recreation Commission as well, because most recreation areas and conservation areas uh, were planned in this in this town to complement one another. So whether it's Groff Park, whether it's Mill River, most of our recreation areas have trails leading to or from or or loop around or within. So it's really nice. Uh, we also have trails that that connect to our elementary schools. So we're expecting a lot of interesting information. We're open to it. Um, you know, a lot of it will depend on resources. What can we do? What, what can we afford to do? 
So we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Dave. Do we know how long the um, window for is for responding to the survey? I think it's, it's going to be open for a little while. Um, and we were hoping to do a couple public information sessions. There was actually supposed to be one tomorrow, but we've been so busy, we haven't really had a chance to plan it. Um, but uh, some information sessions, I think one of them would be a Zoom and one of them would be an in-person. Um, so once I have dates determined for that, and it's basically to <clears throat> share what we've done so far in terms of meetings and planning, and also to um, share any results that we've received thus far on the survey. Um, so uh, I'll keep you posted on when we set those those dates in case you guys want to attend. Well, one great example before we move on is um, the, uh, the new playground, the relatively new playground at Kendrick Park. When we've been doing some of our outreach years ago, what we heard from many young parents of young children was there's not enough green space in downtown Amherst. There's not enough to do for kids when we bring our kids maybe to go get a cup of coffee or go to a restaurant or just shop or whatever. There isn't anything to do. We, you know, we can run on the town common, but, you know, and Kendrick Park was just sitting there, or, you know, it's just green space. What can we do there? So we kind of took that, translated that into, oh, there's a plan for Kendrick Park, and one element of that plan was to develop a small, uh, modest playground. So we went out and got uh, 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 grants and CPA dollars to do that. So, and there's a whole plan for Kendrick with with more amenities there. So that's an example of where kind of open space and recreation got together and said, heard the feedback, and then put that into action. So we expect a lot of creative ideas. Uh, what do what do young families want to see out there? Buffers, Mount Pollux, and the list goes on, and for recreation programs too. So, right. nice. thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Jason. That kind of slipped by. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have eight minutes. Can we handle the UMass culvert replacement? Oh, go ahead, Bruce. Minutes. There were no minutes on them. Yes. Oh. So, I don't know why I'm echoing. Um, <clears throat> My apologies on minutes. Um, I, again, spent about a solid week working on a grant application. Um, and so it, it took me away from basically everything else. Um, but my hope is that we'll have multiple sets of minutes to approve on the next meeting. Um, I just did not have a chance to review them prior to them getting posted. Feel compelled to ask. <laughs> I appreciate it, Bruce. You keep me honest. Okay, how about that culvert? Yeah, so um, I've been monitoring the culvert replacement project that's taking place behind the Village Park um, apartments off of Northeast Street, about 950 Northeast Street. This is the location. It was previously a site of a UMass um, enforcement because they replaced a culvert without a permit. Um, they filed a new notice of intent and we we permitted the replacement, the proper replacement of the culvert that had been replaced or that had been um, replaced in violation. Um, all of the work has been completed. There is stabilization measures in terms of erosion control blankets, straw wattles. They put in um, uh, willow stakes. There's been um, monitoring reports that have been submitted to the commission throughout the whole um, replacement project and and. Um, restoration project really. Um, they they inquired with me, uh, the consultant for UMass inquired with me as to whether they could stop monitoring. And my response was, you know, the work was done in the winter. We don't have any permanent stabilization measures established out there. There's no vegetation that's that's become established. And so until the erosion controls come out, I'd feel really uncomfortable um, saying no inspections, but I do think that we could move from weekly inspections to monthly inspections. If the commission is willing to consider that, that's something that I think would be reasonable. Um, but it's really at your discretion if you want to continue with the the weekly or if you are well, comfortable moving to monthly until the growing season gets established. Thanks, Aaron. Any comments from commissioners? Ahead, Bruce. So does that mean you go to monthly and then back to weekly once things are growing? 
No, it would just be because the work is all completed. Um, it would basically be we'd be monthly until essentially until the erosion controls come out, um, which would probably be, I'm guessing, um, mid to late June by the time things get growing. Andre? Yeah, I think that if uh, Aaron finds it to be reasonable, I'm I'm in agreement with that. Thanks, Alex. Would it be susceptible to flooding? Um, I think any site is susceptible to flooding these days. So certainly, yes. Um, the uh, yeah, I mean it's. The, our side, the Amherst side, is a lot less susceptible to flooding than the Hadley side, um, where much of the restoration work took place. But um, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I feel really uncomfortable ceasing monitoring at this point. Um, I think some level of monitoring has to happen. Even, if, I mean, another option is biweekly. Um, but again, whatever folks are comfortable with. Laura? Yeah, I, I support... Um... Aaron's recommendation, I think it's, I'd be very comfortable moving to monthly until you actually see some activity. The growing season starts. Okay, I agree um, with everything said. So I think we can just go ahead and let them know that's the preference of the commission. Sound good? entirely up to you guys um okay do we need a motion on this yeah, or are we, we just make a motion? um i think a motion would be helpful just to make sure that we have a consensus of everyone all right so looking for a motion to update the umass culvert replacement um request to change inspections from weekly to none to instead to monthly until final inspection so um, second i'll give it to andre Laura's got the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Okay, we got three minutes. Um, should we just cover the sewage incident? Sure. Um... So if you look in the correspondence folder of your packet this week, you'll see that there was a sewer overflow at Hickory Ridge. Um, uh, Dave, do you want to, Dave was on oh, site. Yeah, I just made a note of that. Um, I wasn't looking at the agenda and I said, oh, I forgot to update the commission on this. Um, but yeah, so Friday, uh, last Friday, um, we got notified um, by one of the state folks who was out doing some recon on the on the site, um, doing some biological um, monitoring out on the site that uh, he had observed um, sewage coming out of a manhole. This is on the northeastern portion of the property, uh, not visible from West Pomeroy Lane. This is kind of uh, north of the river. And then, um, yeah, kind of in the northeast corner, if you will, of the property. So um, I was able to get out there by about one o'clock in the afternoon on Friday after we had heard about the the, um, the release. Uh, DPW crews were already out there. This is an area of um, what we call a cross-country sewer line, basically a line that, you know, goes under large parcels. Uh, the Our sewer lines, our forced mains and other sewer lines go under a lot of agricultural land. They go in this case, they go under the Fort River, um, and um, this is an area that is very hard to reach with any kind of um, uh, equipment or apparatus to unplug uh, these sewer lines. Um, this area does have a, just as a little background, does have a history of getting plugged, uh, even when this was a golf course. Uh, this did happen through the years. I, I don't know how many times, but... <laughs> In the event, uh, DPW crews were out there quickly. Uh, we assessed the situation. Um, I won't go into great detail, but um, most of these um, sewer line issues are now caused by flushable wipes, just to give you maybe 
a little more information, but this is a practical matter for the DPW and it is um, something they try to educate Amherst residents on, um, but it's kind of a losing battle. So anyway, um, we don't know how long the uh, release was happening, um, but DPW got on it Friday afternoon. They stopped within an hour of me getting there with DPW. They had the, the line unplugged, unclogged, and um, they were moving toward um, uh, cleaning up the site. I believe they then came back on, I believe on Saturday to finish the work. They did all the uh, necessary DEP uh, reporting of the release. Um, and then what they do is they do an immediate cleanup of the area around the uh, manhole. And then they spread lime for X number of square feet around the, um, around the release area. Certainly some, um, some uh, material was released into the Fort River. The Fort River, we, uh, I checked the Fort River with the town engineer. It is running very strong right now. Um, there's no 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 estimate right now of how much got into the river, but it certainly did get into the river. I think um, as Aaron and I talked about, dilution is the solution in this case. There's no way to go back in time to know when this first started to happen. It's just great that um, uh, we were made aware of it and uh, DPW got on it right away. We do want to talk with some of the folks at the state, at DEP and at Natural Heritage and may come back to you. There may be some straightforward solutions for trying to get better access for DPW in the future. Once this land becomes um, open space, you know, the open space uses are realized. Um, but this problem will keep happening unless DPW can get in there and maintain this line in a more consistent way. So um, anyway, I'll stop there. Probably more information than you'd like on a on a Wednesday night, but that's the reality. Um, so fortunate. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be important to keep an eye on that particular issue, especially when we're going to be calling this open space for endangered species. Um, and just sort of noting that I feel like every time we have a meeting, we're talking about a sewage overflow, and I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, maybe we maybe we can talk about that when we have some more time. Um, it just seems to be a recurring issue and lots of emergency certs. Mm. Okay, I I think that was just an update for the commission. There's no action to be taken. Is that right, Erin? Yeah, I mean, Dave and I had talked about issuing an emergency certification to cover the work. Um, I just ran out of time to do that on on a Monday, but um, it was basically because this particular incident sort of required a little more by way of cleanup than a typical um, uh, sewer overflow in terms of like um, they actually had to use equipment to to scrape up a lot of the material. And so, um, you know, it's really kind of now that we're here, we can talk about that. Does the commission, the, the cleanup work is done. Um, does the commission, we, we did file all the appropriate paper paperwork with DEP in terms of the sewer overflow, but if the commission feels like we should issue an emergency response just to cover the DPW in terms of the work that they completed um, last week, we can certainly do that. Um, it's, you know, it's really sort of at, at our discretion at this point. If I could, Michelle, I would prefer to just do the emergency cert just so we have a, you know, a, you know, so we have that both on the DEP side, but also on the town side to do an emergency cert for the work, even though it's after the fact, we we often, do, you know, not often do this, but in these types of circumstances, we will do a, an emergency cert even after the fact. And Aaron and I talked about it Friday. She just, you know, the week has been very busy this week. So I think doing one makes sense just so we have that paper trail. And as we discuss with DEP and with the commission and with Natural Heritage, how do we address this situation moving forward so that we avoid avoid these things in the past or in the, in the, in the future, sorry. Yeah, I agree. I think that's our standard and I'd like to just keep, a, keep track of it. Go ahead, Alex. Um, seems like an easy decision and at seven, 34, maybe we could just decide and move on. Go ahead and make a motion. Good. I, I move that there be a, uh, 
uh, and, uh, and an order issued uh, to cover the sewer. I don't, you can dress it up however you want. Yeah, just an emergency certification. I second it. Alex on the motion, Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre, did I already get aye. one? Laura? Aye. I'm an aye. You got everyone right? Okay. Um, all right, we can move on to our first hearing. Um, so this is, uh, do we have our hearing procedures slide, Erin? Yes. Thank you. Um, while she's pulling that up, if you're here for Pure Sky, um, for WD Coles on Shootsbury Road, SWCA for Lot 13, New Mass, Wendell Wetland Services on Levert Road, um, for Stonefield Engineering for Valley CDC on Ball Lane, those are going to be continued tonight. Okay, hearing this general procedure for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. The structure is five minutes for staff, five minutes for the applicant, uh, five minutes for public comment or two minutes per person, and then five minutes for conservation commissioners. Uh, the commission requires all submitted and revised materials to be submitted by Wednesday, the prior week to the meeting at close of business. And for all presenters, please clearly state your name, address of the project who are representing and preferred pronouns. For the public, please state your name, address, and also preferred pronouns. Okay, um, so this is for notice of intent for Karen Environmental Consulting LLC on behalf of LLS e LLC and WD Coles Incorporated for the construction of a battery storage system associated access road improvements and stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Montague Road, Route 63, Map 2A, Lot 18. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act Relative to the Protection of the Wetlands, as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Okay, and for the public, um, I'll be keeping an eye on the room, so if you have any questions related to this hearing, just please raise your hand and um, we'll get to you. So Aaron, do you want to give us an update on this? So this was a a site visit that needed to be rescheduled because of the not snow day. So we're a little behind on um, where we thought we'd be on this, but go ahead, Erin. Yes. Um, so um, our site visit was canceled. Um, I, I have started reviewing the materials. Um, this is a, a permit that requires approval um, through the Zoning Board of Appeals, as well as the Conservation Commission um, as well. Um, I know the fire department has their eyes on it and, and is starting to sort of delve into the review process. So um, we'll be re rescheduling the site visit so that staff and the commission can get out to the site. Um, just by way of sort of background um, in consideration of the project, a couple things to keep in mind is that this project will require a waiver of the 50 foot no disturb buffer, as well as a waiver of the 75 foot commercial and industrial building setback to wetlands. Um, and I'm gonna yield the rest of my time to the applicant to present the project and take questions, um, but I'll be prepared to um, provide a full review to the commission prior to the next meeting. Thanks, Erin. And it looks like Eric Anderson is here on behalf of the applicant. Um, yes, Eric. And I just let um, Chuck or Charles in. And um, if anybody else from the applicant side wants to um, join the Zoom call as a panelist, just raise your hand and we'll pull you in. Hi, Eric. Hi, Chuck. Hey, how are Go you ahead. doing? Hi, everyone. Good. Hi, how um, are you? Doing great. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you guys. Uh, my name is Eric Anderson. I'm an apple uh, rep representative of the applicant LSE Fornax, um, who is uh, proposing to construct a battery energy storage system within the 100 foot wetland uh, buffer zone. Um, the property is off Pulpit Hill Road, um, but the project site is more closely located to Montague Road. Um, it's right next to 451 Montague Road. 
um, just across from Old Montague Road. Um, for some quick background on the project, this uh, battery project was actually approved um, by the town of Amherst back in 2020. Um, at the time we got our special permit and uh, had an interconnection services agreement secured with Eversource. Um, after getting our approval with the town, we moved forward to procurement. And at that point, Eversource broke the terms of their uh, interconnection services agreement with us uh, due to a conflict um, with the location that we had chosen at that point. Um, we were pretty mature with the project at this point, so we had to go to the Department of Public Utilities to settle the matter. Um, and after working with them over the past couple of years, we've agreed on uh, to move the project to a location that works with Eversource's revised standards for battery projects. Um, with that, we are within a wetland buffer zone now. So we come back to the town asking for um, approval on our notice of intent that we filed uh, due to being in a wetland buffer zone. Um, and then in the event that we're able to move forward, we would also move forward with a special permit with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, the project is 9,642 square feet in total. Uh, and that includes the electrical equipment for the project, uh, containment structure. Um, we have chain link fencing, an access road, uh, associated utility poles and electrical connections. Um, the development area that we're proposing represents uh, only 3% of the total wetlands buffer area on the property. And approximately half of that is already disturbed. So we are proposing to disturb about 1.4, I think, percent of the total wetland buffer area on the property. Um, and before I hand it over to Chuck to maybe fill in some of the blanks that I've left, um, the project's not within uh, in a, an area that would impact a estimated habitat of state-listed rare wetland wildlife, uh, nor is the project in an area of critical environmental concern, an area designated as outstanding water resource, or an area um, that would be subject to the wetlands restriction order. So. Um, Chuck, is there anything I missed that you could speak to? Well, I think it's just that, you know, we delineated the uh, the wetlands there. Um, the That area had been flagged by um, New England Environmental SWCA. I'm not sure the exact timing of that. Um, at the time that the uh, solar project had been done on the, the, the far end of this site. Um, I found a few remains of their flags when I was doing my delineation. It pretty much followed along where they were. A couple spots, I think I was a little, a few feet further up the slope to where they had it. Um, <clears throat> it's all a combination of, well, it's all overgrown field, um, basically in various stages of reverting back to forest, um, where the the project itself is proposed is an old, entirely old field. It's just very recently been abandoned. It's still all grass and herbaceous vegetation. And unfortunately, a lot of bittersweet coming in. Um, there's also, in addition to the BVW, there is a perennial stream uh, to the east of the site, but to, yeah, east of the project, uh, it kind of cuts through the site um you know we've also it's a very clearly defined stream we've um delineated that also when the project is entirely outside of the riverfront area from that um on that we've got uh the you know, kind of standard erosion controls proposed around it and um as part of the the mitigation for this uh we uh we proposed about a 30 thousand square foot area where it will be uh the invasive species will be maintained or not maintained controlled um it's, it's kind of a, to be adding some site improvements outside of where the actual work is for this um that came up this i don't think anyone mentioned the, we had initially filed this close to a year ago and aaron had a, a lot of uh, questions of, of, and things that she wanted us to address that we spent the last several months working through. Um, and one of the things that did come up was trying to do this invasives management in the area of it to um, 
it basically is some type of mitigation and site improvement. I don't think I have anything else to add wetlands wise. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, I see a hand up from the public. So I'm gonna take public comment. Um, Timothy Kuhn, I'm gonna allow you to talk. So just unmute yourself. Good evening. Actually, I am uh, Tim Kuhn with J.R. Russo and Associates. We were the site engineer. I just wanted to make my presence known that I am here if there are any engineering related questions regarding the site plan. Got it. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Um, uh, in that case, I don't see any other comments from the public. Uh, commissioners, comments, questions? Alex, go ahead. You're muted. On the on the drawings, I believe I saw a roof over the batteries. And um, I think I got the project correct. And it was my understanding that uh, fire department didn't really want roofs over batteries. I understand that's to keep the uh, the elements from the. OK, I don't know what that was all about, but anyways, so I wanted I was just going to ask uh, about the roof. And um, um, your understanding of how the fire department thinks about roofs, it, I'll just say it's my understanding that they think it interferes with uh, uh, putting out a fire if there is one. But I'm that's all from memory. And then I have one other question or statement, but I'll come back for that after they answer. Okay, thanks, Alex. Aaron, do you want to jump in on that first? Yeah, if I could. Um, so just want to mention um, that Jason Skields and I met with the applicant back in May of 2023 and thoroughly reviewed the plan and there was a series of recommendations based on stormwater management and also um, recommendations in terms of containment of stormwater and containment of any potential contaminants coming off of the equipment pad. And so at that point, um, it was a recommendation of um, the uh, town engineer that we put um, a roof over the top and sort of some um, containment um, you know, under the, the structures for the equipment pad. But obviously the um, the discussions we've recently had with this is, you know, just within the last few weeks, the information um, from the fire department came to light. This is new information um, that they were concerned about um, the coverings over the top of the batteries. Now, I think it's um, something that the fire department needs to review and comment on. So I, and I think we need to give them an opportunity to do that. So before um, we get too deep in it. I think I'd like to get some comment from the fire department regarding the design concept that they've developed, but I recognize that that comment did come up at the last meeting relative to the battery containment. Thanks, Erin. Um, Alex, did you have a follow-up or should I move on? Um, we move on, but I, I, I was kind of hoping to hear from them, but maybe Erin has said enough. Okay. I don't see anyone I'll, chiming in. It looks like Alex has raised his hand to respond, Michelle. I'll come back later. Oh, Eric. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. So I'm trying to uh, stay in line with your raising hand procedure and just not jump in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I was just going to, you know, piggyback what Aaron was saying. Um, we had worked with her and, and Mr. Skeels on the containment design. Uh, it was what they recommended at the time. And um, you know, we are just looking to follow what the town's requirements are in the event that the fire department has um, a different opinion at this time. Um, we're certainly looking for their guidance and um, we've reached out to them for comment and haven't heard back. So, um, you know, in the interest of adhering to all the concerns that the town has, um, we're just looking forward to continuing to work with them. And if they have any um, design considerations, we, we're happy to adopt them. Great, thanks. Sorry, it's hard to see your hand on the brick in the background. <laughs> um, Andre, you wanna go next? Yeah, um, well, uh, thanks, uh, 
Eric and Chuck um, for your presentation. Chuck, I had, uh, my question was to you. You mentioned uh, earlier uh, mitigation of uh, with uh, 30,000 uh, square feet area. Um, would you mind just clarifying what the mitigation uh, work would be? Um, let me see what basically, um, at this point, we, we haven't gone into great detail. The area has a lot of invasive as happens every time a field abandoned these days. Um, there's a lot of bittersweet European buckthorn and, um, the multiflora rose and, and some other things. Um, we were at this point just looking looking to you know as part of the approval of the, the 30,000 square feet and um basically as part of the mitigation work with a you know vegetation control specialist to come up with the the exact specifics of uh what they what they would need to do to treat everything um i think a lot of, you know a lot of it may be it be pulled up, but I'm not a big fan of thinking we can control invasives without some herbicide use, in, you know, even, at least in some limited manner. Um, but we really haven't gone into the specifics other than outlining the the area that will be managed. So, uh, just for clarification, what you're uh, what what you're proposing to do is to uh, essentially uh, clear out. In one way or another, um, the invasives out of uh, that thirty uh, thousand square square foot area is that right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And then, I, we had um, make sure I get this right. You know, it's, it's going to have to be over. You know, obviously, a, not just a single treatment. It's probably going to have to be. You know, to make a meaningful difference, go back for you know at least one or two years, and try to give the native vegetation a chance to outcompete the invasives. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Eric, is your hand raised again? Yeah, sorry. Um, I, was, okay. I wanted to second what uh, Chuck had said. So our uh, so the way that we got to that square footage is we were doing a hundred foot buffer zone from our limit of disturbance. And given that um, there's a wetland buffer area that hugs um, kind of the southwestern corner of our limit of disturbance, that's where we're looking to um, do our invasive species management in a wetland buffer zone area, uh, and then also on the other side of the project as well. Um, the intent is to do that for three years and hire um, someone that's licensed to mechanically remove the invasive species. And then also um, to have that person be a licensed applicator for um, an herbicide that is approved for aquatic use. And we would do that through cut stem methods on woody plants or, or plants, you know, um, that have like those thick rhizomes, um, just seconding what Chuck's saying about, you know, not being able to necessarily through mechanical means uh, get rid of a lot of those uh, deep rooted plants. So. Thanks, Eric. Laura, go ahead. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Actually, that was one of my follow-up questions um, with the mitigation plan. I guess two two questions now. Um, I remember when this deal, uh, when this um, when this uh, proposal came in front of the commission. Aaron, can you tell me when you and Jason um, provided feedback to the applicant, did they make all of the requested changes? Because it looks like they've addressed. I, I was going through earlier today. They've addressed most of them. Are there any that have yet to be addressed? That's the first question. And then second question is, as part of a, you know, uh, it, it sounds as though we would want some sort of, uh, you know, report on what the plan is for, for mitigation, um, you know, a formal, a formal um, plan of what the intentions are of the applicant. Yeah, so that was, uh, thank you. So I, was going to recommend to the applicant that prior to the next meeting, you might want to get some sort of um, sort of a specific prescription methodology related to the um, mitigation area for the commission to consider. Um, 
you know, the, the commission will certainly consider what you're proposing, but I think you might need to get a little more specificity with regard to what the mechanical treatments you're proposing to, to do on site are, as well as, you know, your means of removal of the uh, invasives once they're, once they're cut, and then um, the specifics for what the treatment would actually be and, and what, um, uh, uh, chemical treatment is is proposed to be used on site so those details will be will be necessary so i would say um those are uh, my recommendations prior to the next meeting for something they could get started on in terms of response um i would like to say that the response uh to our comments was really was really great um they definitely worked to address all of our comments so i really appreciate that one of the sort of challenges, and I think if you read through the application, you'll see this, is that they're extremely limited with where they can, um, because this is an Eversource interconnection project and there are certain rules related to uh, safety of the um, interconnection, they were really limited in terms of their ability to move further away or shift um, to different location on the site. So that was, I think that's kind of the biggest challenge of this project is the, you know, the site location and the proximity. And that's something that the applicant doesn't, it seem have a ton of control over. So um, I think that they have addressed staff comments that have been provided to them thus far. Mm -hmm. And one, one question to Eric, or uh, I think you're the right person. Um, certainly familiar with the uh, Eversource and DPU delays. Um, what was the reason, I I what was the re the reason did your timeline expire or it's unusual for the utility to not honor um, an interconnection agreement. So I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, you're, uh, you're definitely right that it's unusual. <laughs> it wasn't something that we were expecting after getting so far along um, in our process. Um, the reason why is Eversource uh, was requiring that um, the facility be within the line of sight of the point of common coupling for the project um, and that wasn't something that was shown in our site plan or line diagram or any material that we had reviewed with them throughout the entirety of our interconnection process. Um, and it was only after we had agreed to the site planning line diagram on file um, and signed a whole ISA uh, regarding it and began to procure our equipment that that was a, a new requirement that had, hadn't been brought up before. Um, so that's why we ended up going to the Department of Public Utilities, because it's highly unusual to have an agreement signed, um, you know, just for new requirements or or whatever to be put on it. Can I ask a follow up question? I don't want to. Yeah, go um, ahead, Michelle. Um, so, you know, when I look at this project as a whole, um, it's been under development for a long time. It is most unfortunate that it's now touching wetland area. I guess the question to you, Aaron, is, um, is there precedent with the commission when you are, you know, I think everyone here would agree, we prefer not to touch sensitive area, but is there precedent with allowing projects um, with certain parameters um, to, to be developed? Um, you know, I think it was like one, one percent or one, one and a half percent of the site or something like that, was that right? Um, so it, the, the project is within 3% of the total wetland buffer area on the property, but a, half of that has already been altered by Eversource's transmission easement. No. So the, the new proposed alteration as a result of the project is one and a half percent. Got it. Yeah, Aaron, so I guess the question is precedent here. Yeah, so um, this is our, our new bylaw, and so it's kind of, we're sort of paving the way to some degree um, with the, you know, how the commission considers this. Um, in terms of the, the new bylaw, one of the requirements per site was a 20% um, alteration limitation, and so um, I think that they're correct me if I'm wrong, but from reading the materials, I think that they're with this project would be at about 30%, but I may have gotten that wrong. 30% um, of the site buffer would be altered essentially um, in total. I mean, the existing alteration coupled with the new, and uh, I want to make sure that that's correct with the applicant, but I think that the um, 
the end sort of result here is to mitigate the impact of what's proposed. And so the commission, I think, can consider mitigation um, kind of at their discretion, right? So if the if the invasive species treatment is adequate mitigation, that's one potential option to consider. If the commission would like to see additional mitigation, that's another option to consider. But I think there's there's a lot of discretion here for the commission to whether the commission will consider it an extenuating circumstance and if they would be willing to consider potential mitigation measures to compensate for the impact. Is, is the 30% impact inclusive of ever sources work on the site with the transmission? It is nearly entirely uh, ever sources transmission easement on site, which the applicant has not contributed uh, to that work. Um, you know, we're not the property owner either. Uh, and I imagine you all understand ever sources, um, you know, process of doing things. So yeah, uh, I would say 20, if not all of the existing wetland buffer area disturbed on site is due to ever sources transmission. And that easement disturbance is a vegetative disturbance with like overhead lines or what exactly is it since I mean a lot of these questions will be asked on site but just to give me a picture of what that is. Mm -hmm. Is it, it rock? It, it's uh it's their transmission lines um that cut through uh lengthwise the entire site. Um and it's their standard um transmission structures um that host those lines. There are some like associated access roads just for Eversource to um, service those lines that run alongside it. Um, and then there's likely some uh, vegetated, you know, uh, clearing, you know, within the buffer zone of those those lines, just so that trees don't get involved. Got it. And can someone just um, remind me or confirm how many square feet are in the five, the 50 foot no disturb, like specifically? Does anybody know? I wouldn't know specifically, I, but I would say it is more than, it is the majority of the project, maybe 50%. It's about half and half that's within the 50 foot, I believe. Uh, Chuck, do you know offhand? No, no, I don't. We never broke that number down that way. I would guess that um, at the, um, the battery storage site itself, it is, I would say, like you said, probably 40, maybe just about half and half is it probably in that 30 to 50 foot zone. And then the remainder is outside of that. Um, but we can, we can break that number down for you if you'd like to see that. Yeah, it's looking for ballpark now. So that's, that's fine for an answer. Go ahead, Bruce. I see you. I think we've gone over the line of too much detail, given that we haven't even gone to the site. Yeah, and, I agree. And we're looking at a continuance. Well, um, I wanted to say in regards to that, that Aaron had mentioned getting a detailed um, restoration plan, but I'm wondering if we can squeeze in a site visit to give us some context about like how we, you know, might interpret that plan before we, you know, you guys expend tremendous amounts of energy doing that. Um, I think that would be helpful for me to see. Um, I don't know if that's reasonable, but maybe you guys could talk to Aaron and we could convene with the commission about availability. Um, go ahead, Alex. We, we can do it anytime, anytime okay. you want. We'll, we'll probably trigger another snowstorm when we schedule <laughs> it. But. Right. With regard to the 20% of the 100 foot buffer, we often talk about uh, a project going into 20% of the buffer, but there's a phrase that follows in our rules, which we hardly ever talk about. And then it's, it's, um, there's a comma after the 20% and it says, provided that the applicant shows that um, going into the 20% the of the 100 foot does not damage the functions and values of the wetland. So one of the questions that we really need to address is, what functions and values of the wetland are being affected and then match the mitigation to it. And uh, you've already mentioned that the area is prior disturbed. And so um, when we go on a site visit, 
one of the things that I'd like to look at is, uh, you know, what does it look like the functions and values of of the area are? And um, uh, I bring it up now so you folks can give some thought to that. That might give us some guidance on what mitigation is appropriate. I'm sorry, okay. I didn't go back and review those rules before speaking. And then what I just said is from memory, but Aaron has it, we all have it. And you can probably look it up on our website. It's right in the first paragraph. Thanks, Alex. Thank Jason? Yeah, just the, the invasive species management, you know, based on what, what Alex was just saying, and I'm looking at it now, are we considering, I mean, we're considering the invasive species management to be uh, improving the function of the area, correct? Of the resource? That's the intent, yeah. Okay. It's like a, a ecological lift, not necessarily a replication. Sure. All right. And then is... Um, on the site plans, it shows a, an underground gas line coming in. Is that proposed or is that existing? I don't believe that we are proposing a gas line. That was a good thing. Tim, do you, can you speak to this? Uh, well, it says UG, so I just assumed it was underground gas, but. Mm -hmm. No, the, the UG just stands for underground utility. That That's just the uh, the transmission line and conduit uh, that'll carry the electric. So is that proposed okay. or is that existing? It's proposed. That would be proposed. Okay. So I see on the site plans, silt fence, temporary erosion control blanket um, around the battery storage area, but I don't see any BMPs around then the proposed trench for the underground utilities, for the roadway, any other BMPs for, and then where where is the rest of the plan? Where does that underground utility go? It just kind of goes off the page. So what other BMPs are proposed for this additional work outside <clears throat> of just this pad for the battery storage? Well, the proposed BMPs will handle the extension of the driveway as well, because the if you can if you look at the the con, existing contours out there, uh, where that road is the driveway extension is being constructed, all grades down, and basically any runoff from that area would come down to the uh, the area where our silt fence is. Um, with regard to the underground utility trench, as you continue to the left off the page. Uh, there is another sheet uh, provided in the plan set, which shows it basically extending up adjacent to the existing access road um, to the uh, utility poles that are up closer to the site entrance. And for that, um, we are not sh showing any specific uh, silt fence or anything like that because the, the installation uh, of that conduit would be a like a day, you're gonna open up a trench, put in your conduit and then backfill the trench. Um, so there's a very minor disturbance of however wide the trench is. And, and we don't feel that, uh, that it's really necessary to, to put in a, a silt fence along that entire thing that there's sufficient vegetated filter strip for that small area of disturbance. And the, especially based on the limited time that'll be open. And that area of disturbance is, it appears between the 30 and the 100 foot buffer. So presumably within the 50 foot buffer. So are you including that in your overall, um, you know, square footage for alteration? I believe it was. Yeah, and I, I would confirm that we we did our alteration based on the entire project, not just the equipment pad or the battery itself. You good, Jason? Yep. Okay, Bruce. 
For the record, who is Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Oh, can you I just state your- I don't know who he is. Can you state your affiliation and- I apologize again. My, my name is Timothy Kuhn. I'm a professional engineer with J.R. Russo and Associates who prepared the site plans. J.R. Roots? Russo. Russo, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any public comment left. So unless there's any further questions for the applicant, we're going to hopefully, we're going to continue this tonight and hopefully have a near term site visit and talk about um, mitigation plans and next steps. So looking for a motion. I will move to continue the public hearing for the Montague Road Battery Storage NOI to 735 p.m. on 2 28 24. I'll second that. Jason on the motion, Laura on the second. Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Thank you, Tim, Chuck, and Eric. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next up is the abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for Pure Sky Development Incorporated on behalf of WD Coles Inc. represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site, limited to areas that fall within 100 feet of the proposed solar installation at Sheets Bray Road, map 9B, lots 11 and 12, and map 9D, lots 27. So there's still some communication with a third party reviewer and the project applicant. Is that correct, Darren? So um, they need some more time to work things out and we are looking to continue this tonight. Um, do you wanna give any more updates? Um, and if there's any public comment, I'm willing to take that. So raise your hand. Yeah, I'll just provide a quick update. Um, and I updated materials in the project folder, but um, Emily Stockman did an initial review of the um, revised wetland delineation and came back with a series of um, recommendations for additional um, uh, revisions to the, to the updated plan. Um, the applicant is currently working to update the plans uh, to address Emily's comments. And once that plan is, is revised, it will come back to us, back to Emily, to give it um, a final look before it comes to the Conservation Commission for consideration. Thanks, Erin. Okay, I'm seeing no questions from commissioners or public. I'm looking for a motion to continue. I will move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road and Rad to 7.40 p.m. on 2-28-24. Second. Jason on the motion, Andre on the second, Laura? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Bruce is muted. Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Did I get everyone? Aye. Minute. Okay, <laughs> Jason, aye. Unanimous. Okay, um, next up. SWCA, Notice of Intent on behalf of University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at lot 13, Olympia Drive, map 8D, lots 15, 16, and 3. So I think Aaron indicated that we were going to maybe look for a more meaningful continuation date for this one um, rather than recycle it every other two weeks. Um, but you want to give us any updates on it, Erin? Yes. Um, so the applicant did give confirmation that we could do a one month continuation, which would put us to um, March 13th at 7.30 p.m. So we can adjust that time accordingly. And I'll, I'll update the motion as well. That makes things easier. Okay, any questions? Public commissioners. Bruce, go ahead. Um, the third bullet from the bottom, which is I think carried over from past meetings, asked a question. And I look back at the minutes and I don't see in 
the last meeting that we answered the question. So is it, Aaron, is this still a question or it's just, you can let it go or we've decided or? Um, still a question. I it, mean, uh, yeah, that was my understanding. It was still a question. I think the applicant asked the commission to, um, to, to give them additional time to do some um, site due diligence and come back to the commission with a revised plan. I know they're working on some some stuff um, as well. So I, I would just say I've kind of left that alone on the slide um, since that meeting. And so I think it's still something that needs to be answered based on what they come back with. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, with that, looking for a motion to continue. Um, and we have an updated date there. I, I would move that uh, to continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive notice of intent to 7.30 p.m. on March 13th, 24. Second that. Bruce on the motion. Andre on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? You're muted. Try again. Verbal, I mean, visual confirmation that he's an I. I'm an I. Okay. Unanimous. Moving on. Um, notice of intent. Uh, have we opened this one? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Kevin and Mary O'Brien for the construction of a new 1,200 square foot single family home and associated site work within Riverfront area of Eastman Brook at 260 Leverett Road, map 3A lots 50. This project is proposed as a riverfront redevelopment project replacing an existing garage and chicken coop structure. Um, I don't see any project applicants here, um, but I think, Aaron, this was going to be a courtesy continuation um, since we haven't gotten any confirmation otherwise, or is there an update on that? Um, no, but I would just refer the commission to the project folder if you'd like to get some greater insight into why this is being continued. Um, and I can just give you a quick snapshot of that. The original submission was a hand-drawn plan that was not to scale, and it didn't include all of the work that was proposed. Um, town staff have met with the um, with the applicants. Uh, several departments met with the applicant and was given he was given detailed instructions that we need a site plan and all the information that needs to be included on the site plan. Um, um, it's been a little challenging to, I guess, translate what's needed to the engineer. So I've asked to speak to them directly and I'm hoping that that communication will take place. But I think that the applicant's a little um, unsure or unfamiliar with the commission's process. And so when I asked for a continuation, they said they wanted the commission to review the project and approve it. And I said, well, we can't review anything without a plan that shows the work. So I'd like to just request a courtesy continuation on their behalf to give them some additional time to try to work with their engineer to um, provide a plan that addresses what the commission needs to see. Thanks, Aaron. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, is this the project that DEP gave them a letter or a, a file, and that's why they have a? I, I'm yes. just curious as why they have an NOI. They yes. Filed an NOI. Yes, you're 100 percent DEP number. Okay. Yes, I I don't think DEP even looked at the plan. I think if well maybe they did, but I I did ask them. I said, is this an acceptable plan for a notice of intent application? And they said, oh, the commission will figure it out. Um, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of how I felt as well. I was like, um, yeah, that puts us in a really unfair position because really it should have, I wouldn't have, ex I was not, I was going to actually reject the application and say it's not sufficient. Um, but because DEP issued the file number so quickly, we had 21 days to open the public hearing. So our options are basically to continue or to deny. And I think in fairness to the applicant to try to make the necessary changes to the plan um, and give them a little more time, this would just be sort of the fair thing to do at this point. 
do we have a time frame in which we cease to give them courtesy extensions and just deny it and then they have to go through the whole process again yeah i mean so i just just for the commission and i think this is a really great conversation to have um the commission has a lot of discretion I have seen public hearings, uh, I'm not exaggerating, I've seen public hearings get continued for two years straight. Um, and at the end of that two years after requesting ex extension after extension, the commission has said, if you're gonna continue to do this, you're gonna have to re-notify a butters and, and um, repost a legal ad because it, it starts to become unfair to a butters they can't um follow the um ongoing continuances and keep any sort of a finger on the pulse of what's going on and um so yeah i think and i think that that's not just applicable to this application but it's applicable to every application um when you start to see i would say over 15 continuances on a given application it starts to sort of Unless it's a really out, um, extenuating circumstance and the applicant is um, working overtime to try to address comments or, or issues um, or it's an appeal situation or something like that, um, there, you know, we've got to draw the line somewhere. And I think that's really at the commission's discretion to decide. 15 still seems excessive to me, but um, <laughs> I was just yeah. throwing out a number, but I, I, yeah. I mean, I'm at the point with the UMass one where. I would prefer to not con continually continue it, um, you know, and coming in a project like this, coming in with plans that were not in any way adequate. Like, I understand that, you know, a, a personal a homeowner has, there's no reason why you would expect that a homeowner would have any experience in doing this if they've never done it before. Mm -hmm. But somebody had to engineer, like they had to get engineering to build a structure. And I would expect that those folks would have some experience in this and to, um, I'm fine with the continuation now, but I really would would err more on the side of like, oh, we make two or three courtesy continuations and then and then we, we make a decision there to either just, I guess, I don't know what the term is, either reject it or just continue it in yeah, so a couple ideas to consider are, um, and I don't want to jump in ahead of Bruce, but just some ideas to consider are um, giving them a deadline and saying we're going to need additional information within 30 days, within 60 days. Um, otherwise, if we don't get an update within that period of time, um, the commission's going to ask you to withdraw the application and resubmit when you're prepared to to actually, you know, share the necessary information or um, the commission could deny for lack of information and the denial for lack of information and, and any denial um, basically has to detail um, from a regulatory standpoint what information is missing and why it is necessary in order for the commission to make a decision. So um, those are those are absolutely avenues that we could take. And I'd look forward to talking to the commission more about that once we're ready to have that conversation whenever that is. Yeah. As one last comment. You know, I say all this. Um, you know, we've we've extended the UMass project now so many times. I feel it only fair everybody else gets that same uh, grace period then. But I would like to see some sort of precedent set. Thanks, Jason. Go ahead, Bruce. Mine's a process question, so I yield to Laura. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, no, I'm I'm gonna completely echo Aaron here in that in my however many years, four years on the three years on the commission, we have had um so many hearings that have been uh it's difficult to track and difficult for um you know community members to stay on top of things. So I think it would be a really good conversation to have that unless someone's actively working to advance the process. It's not fair just to have it stall out, not only to the commissioners who have to then, you know, pick everything up and kind of remember what was said, but also um, to the community members, so. Thanks, Laura. And um, I think <clears throat> if we're going to have that discussion of precedent and process, then we probably need to start with um, 
UMAP 113 um, and start getting some progress reports from that so that we have something tangible and you know tractable to work with. And then this I think is the third um, continuance and has there been a site visit? Like have we had any benchmarks with this one? No, no okay. because there's really no point of having a site visit. Right. Um, you know, if we don't have the the area of work identified, the limit of work identified, the extent of what's being proposed even identified on a plan. It's, it's. I mean, we can have a site visit, but the reality is that once the plan comes through, we're probably going to want another one in order to go see where everything is and the configuration, the layout on the land of, of what they're proposing to do. So, I mean, my preference is before having a site visit is to get a plan because otherwise it's kind of a waste of our time. But I mean, if the commission feels otherwise, um, you know, that's completely fine. I just want to be fair to everybody's time. Go ahead, Bruce. So my question is a more overarching one, and the, the, it starts with how do we have overarching conversations? And the two issues here are if we wanted to set a maximum number of continuances, how do we do that? We don't do it inside one hearing. And in addition to that, my other question is what's the downside of pushing back against DEP and asking them to rescind the number? So that, these are not appropriate for this because we maybe can't do it in this one, but down the road, maybe. So how do we have those other conversations? Well, so my recommendation would be that the commission actually set a time um, on the hearing or on the meeting agenda to, to set aside a half an hour to have this conversation. Um, you know, we could certainly put it on the um, February 28th meeting agenda, but I think it's extremely important for the commission to set policy um, guidance for applicants because um, similar to like our requirements for revisions being submitted a week before um, the meeting, things things like that, it's nice to have clear, concise guidance for applicants because we can then put it on the website um, and and share it with people so they know what the expectations are. If, if we don't tell people, then, um, yeah, you know. That's yeah, that's all I wanted. Just yeah. halfway. Yep. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Okay, so why don't we set aside some time on the agenda next <clears throat> week? Um, maybe like twenty minutes, and we'll probably take more than that. But um, my inkling is generally like a sixty day, because thirty can go quick. But we'll cover out that next. Well, my my request would be that Aaron come to us. Aaron and Dave come to us with a proposal. Yeah, and maybe that could be us. applicable to the two case and points we have. Yeah, there. and if it takes a, a month to get to that point, that's fine with me. I just, yeah. Thank you, Bruce, for making us more efficient. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, just on that note, um, not just a, if if we're looking for Aaron or Dave or, or anybody to come with any kind of suggestions regarding time frame, I also would, would request that we have suggestions regarding uh, essentially a definition of actionable um, steps that applicants can take to continue moving it forward. You know, we don't want to, I don't think that we want to set a precedent for a time frame for people who are actively working, right? It's just these kind of oh, true. continuations. So what, what does it mean to be actively working then? Yeah. Report. Fair enough. Go ahead, Go ahead Andre. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, th I think all these things are uh, items that we can discuss uh, when we have a, a more concentrated time to do that. <clears throat> but, um, you know, if there's nothing happening, then there's the <laughs> then there's there's nothing happening. If, uh, you know, I think maybe including something, some kind of wording, uh, where exceptions will be made under extenuating circumstances. So, you know, if, uh, and, and the communication has to be there between the, uh, the applicants and, uh, and uh, staff as well. So I'm just gonna- Absolutely, yeah. All right, great points, everyone. Please come ready to talk about them next meeting. Um, and with that, we're looking for a motion to continue. 
I move to continue the public hearing for 260 Leverett Road to 7.50 p.m. on 7-28-24. I second that. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, Next up is notice of intent uh, for Tetra Tech, but before we dive into that one, if anybody is here for our last hearing, which is the NOI for Stonefield Engineering for Valley CDC on Ball Lane, that will be continued tonight, so you don't have to stick around too late. Okay, so we're up to notice of intent for Tetra Tech on behalf of Fort River Solar 2 LLC for construction of an operation of a 6.35 megawatt direct current ground malted photovoltaic solar facility and efforts pertinent <laughs> components at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, map 19D, lot 10. I think it's okay. appurtenances. Well, it's not plural on this, but so I'll yield to you, appurtenances. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how's that intro, Matt? Hi, welcome. Um, Good evening, everyone. And I see Lawrence and Sean. Okay, Erin, you want to give us the update, please? Yes. Um. <clears throat> so since the last meeting, um, there's been a lot of communication, um, a lot of plan reviewing going on. Um, I did send a draft um, uh, special conditions for both Wetland Protection Act and our local wetland bylaw to commissioners sort of kind of late this afternoon, but with some additional updates based on uh, my final review of the plans. Um, I think I've um, given commissioners an update on most everything. I think the big um, piece, and I'm not sure how well I communicated this or if I communicated this to the commission, but um, last Wednesday, a uh, final plan was sent to me. I started reviewing it. There were um, some some um, issues with the notes, and so I reached out to Matt, and um, we got that issue resolved, um, some transfer of some of the note revisions that had been made on a previous iteration didn't make it to the final plan set. So we got um, a new final um, plan set. I was able to review the final plans and feel confident that all updates have been made. I did have some sort of last minute edits to the order of conditions just to clarify things. Um, I also drafted a finding of fact, which I felt as I reviewed everything became more and more important just to make sure we detailed because there was so many iterations of back and forth between myself and the applicant through this review process that I wanted to make sure certain things were documented. Um, so that's all been shared with the commission. I'm happy to pull those items up on the screen so that we can all take a quick look at them, but, or, or if you want me to go through what changes I made to the the um, order of conditions I shared, that would have been a version I shared about a month ago that we had already talked about. Um, so I'm happy to go through those with the commission if you'd like. Thanks, Erin. Um, I'm gonna give the floor to the project applicants and then maybe we can pull that up. Yeah, Matt Moyen with Tetra Tech here on behalf of the applicant. Um, not really anything to say tonight. We're here to answer any final questions the commission may have and discuss uh, the conditions and finding of facts as you see fit. Thanks, Matt. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand and I'll keep an eye on the room. Okay, not immediately seeing any. So Aaron, do you wanna pull up the, I guess the order of conditions is what we're looking to discuss specifically. And while you're doing that, Commissioners, please raise your hand if you have any questions for the applicants or Aaron. Go ahead, Alex. Aaron, there's a lot of uh, stuff in the folder for us this time. And I know I went through it. Um, perhaps the other commissioners went through it sufficiently that they don't need to go through it now. And that would be a big time saver because there's a lot in there. Um, so I would just ask 
commissioners if to speak of if they want Erin to go through that. Um, I would favor her just going to the order and showing us what the changes are rather than going through all that transpired. Thanks, Alex. Bruce? Um, my question is, it appears to me that attachment one and attachment two are identical, except that attachment one is under the State Wetlands Protection Act and, at, and number two is under the town of Amherst wetlands bylaw. And I'm curious why there needs to be, why they are not, they're separated because I couldn't find any differences between them. There is one difference between them, but I'm really glad that you brought that up, Bruce, because I think this is a good sort of educational moment for the commission. So whenever you get a, um, a notice of intent application, it is through the state and that is through the Wetland Protection Act process. But in the town of Amherst and in many towns, we have our local wetland protection bylaw and regulations. And so frequently commissions are reviewing permits sort of in tandem. They're reviewing the application under state and under local law. And so it becomes extremely important when we issue orders of conditions that we have conditions that are specific to wetland protection and conditions that are specific to the bylaw. Because if there's ever an appeal to a permit, it's appealed under both, and they're under separate avenues. Um, under state, um, it goes to the DEP, and under our lo local bylaw, it, it goes to Superior Court. So it's very important. Marion, you're breaking up. Um, that they be separated, even if the conditions are. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you seem to have some connectivity. Maybe just turn off your camera or keep going and maybe it's done with. Okay. Um, if you look at condition number three, um, under the um, Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst, um, bordering land subject to flooding is subject to a 100 foot buffer zone. Um, that buffer zone is not shown on the plans of record and I'm not um, suggesting that the applicant should have to add the 100 foot buffer zone at this uh, late stage in the process. It's more or less just to document that that buffer zone does exist. It's not shown on the plans and that the commission's not yielding their jurisdiction to that buffer. But, but the that's way an example. It, well, but number three is the same on both of these sheets. There's no, I'm just, in general, curious why there has to be two different um, uh, attachments. Because the, the reading of number three is essentially identical on both attachment one and attachment two. Yes, it should be. Okay. Aaron, I think you're frozen. Do you think you could just shut your camera off so we can take advantage of your... Maybe it's not that important right now. I'm just right. So in case this. I can... You, you're Bruce. Yeah. Um, I, I think what you have is you have two different um, sets of laws that need to be addressed and, and they both need to be uh, you need to be permitted under uh, state law and under. Uh, okay. Law. okay. I, I yield to the process. It's fine. Intentional redundancy. Okay. Aaron, do we have you or are you? I'm here. Yeah. Okay, Can great. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I can try to share my screen again if um, if no, I run I'm, into issues. Um, I just Doesn't want to matter. make sure that you guys can see the changes. Do you want me to run through them really quickly? What the no, changes no were? I don't. They were on okay. the web this afternoon. Yeah. So are there any other commissioners that want to review the, the changes that Aaron has made and didn't have a chance before or have any questions? Okay. And also maybe the applicant might like to as well, but just give them the option to go through that. I'm not seeing any raised hands from the applicants. Hmm. So, okay, well, I think I this is reflective of the amount of time <laughs> and effort and conversations that has gone into this thus far. So that's great, but go ahead, Alex. Um, I said the commissioners have had time to look at this or have had opportunity and 
Ketratech was sent the um, the draft order previously, I sort of assumed that they were sent um, the document this afternoon after she had finished with it. Am I mistaken, Matt? Have you seen, have you not seen this? Yeah, over the last few weeks, Aaron and I have been- uh, No, I mean this document. About, yeah, this this latest draft order, I've, I've seen it with the exception of one Aaron just discussed about the, the 100 foot buffer to BLSF um, and the understanding she has that it's jurisdictional. Um, there's, there's, a, there's some conflicting language in the local bylaw um, that may be worth taking a look at, but our read on the jurisdictional section of it was that area was not jurisdictional. So we hadn't shown it on our plan. And as Aaron indicated, there's no expectation for us to add it to our plans at this time. So we've, we've seen it, we understand what's in there and uh, we're ready to move forward. Okay. Yeah. So just so that you're aware, she provided about every email back and forth and her own explanation of conversations. And so there was a lot to read. Um, so just for the record, um, this is also the, the finding of fact, um, the finding of fact was to document, um, a, a number of things about this project. The first is the fact that, um, there was previously an approved order of conditions, um, for this project and that we're following DEP guidance relative to having essentially two orders of conditions recorded on the property, um, at one time. Aaron, I'm and, sorry. Um, Sorry, you need to make it one sheet or no one can read it. Um, there, thank you. Yes. Um, so just to document that we're following DEP guidance relative to the two open, essentially, orders of conditions, even though one's expired. Um, I did want to document in here that the applicant already provided a $25,000 donation to the Town of Amherst Trail Fund as mitigation to support the construction of a footbridge boardwalk to accommodate relocation of the existing trail around the project area that was impacted by the project's um, redesign. Mm -hmm. I also went through um, the um, compliance with the um, DEP wetland policy, and basically this was just my read of the overall project relative to compliance with the um, DEP wetlands policy based on my review of the project. So I'll just flip through this. I don't want to go um, item by item, but th these more or less cover things that have been reviewed, discussed, that they've responded to, and or um, things that we've kind of glazed over, for example, like the replacement of the stream crossings going from small undersized culverts to mass stream um, standard compliant crossings, um, the incorporation of BMPs, the change of the fixed array from the original filing to a tracking system, the um, project um, reduced in size in the sense that the, there's less resource area impact on this project than the original filing, um, fence lines have been pulled back, um, the proposed mitigation associated with the project, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't, again, want to cover everything, but um, a lot of these are um, commentary that were provided directly by the applicant to us that um, note um, how they comply with a given um, DEP um, guidance on this, on this item relative to the guidance policy that DEP sets. So I thought this was important just to document and attach to the order of conditions that we've um, been reviewing all of these issues. Thanks, Aaron. I found that very helpful, the historical account to this project. Um, so I'm not seeing any hands from the public, and I just want to say this represents a lot of conversation and back and forth and cooperation from the applicant, staff, and this commission. So thank you, everybody, for being cooperative there and you know the patience and time that it's taken to get to this point. And with that, I'm not seeing any questions. So we're looking for a motion to close this hearing and issue the order of conditions. And maybe Aaron, you could throw that up on the screen. Can you make it bigger, Aaron? I move to close the public hearing and issue order of uh, conditions DEP 
number 0890728 under the Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection uh, Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations with finding of fact attachment. Second. Andre on the motion, Alex on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Yeah, I'll 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 second the uh the the words of um of Michelle. Uh everybody here has done a lot of work on this. Thank you all for uh for for the work and for the patience. And uh hope it goes well. Thanks everyone. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Thanks for the time. Yeah. This far longer than we inspected, and uh we'll come. <laughs> Fully prepared with the uh, the battery stuff at a later date. Bruce, has up. yeah, Bruce, go ahead. I just I was thinking while I was reviewing all this, way out there, five years from now, when this project inside the bigger project are all done, and there's an extraordinary protection of the Fort River, there's the actual moving of uh, electrical uh, things into the grid from the panels, and that. It could be a model for other places, but it's very difficult. I appreciate everyone really trying hard to make this work. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Okay. Well, cheers. Yes. <laughs> that was cheers. a long one. <laughs> um, and uh, we can tie it up easily and be out early, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway. By the way, by Michelle, by my comment, I didn't mean to belittle the amount of time that had gone into this. I am well aware of how much time went in. Oh, I didn't read that in any way. So Good. I think Good. everyone is fully aware of that fact. Um, anyway, I think we, we all did a great job. So thank you everybody for your attention to this and Aaron for the immense amount of time that you've spent making sure that resources are protected and this project can move forward. Um, okay. I think, so, I think it's also her negotiative skill. Yeah. All of the above. Um, okay. Next and last, notice of intent for Stonefield Engineering and Design LLC on behalf of Valley Community Development for the construction of 15 residential duplex structures and associated site work, including parking, utilities, stormwater management, and landscaping within the buffer zone at 20 to 40 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Lot 56. Any updates on this one, Erin? Um, the applicant is uh, working to resolve a um, a design issue with one of the basins, and so they're hoping to have uh, an updated plan set for us uh, by the next meeting. Right. Okay. And they're working with the ZBA on that one? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're just looking for a motion to continue. I move to continue the public hearing for uh, 2040 ball lane NOI to 755 PM on 2-28-24. I'll second it. Alex on the motion, Bruce on the second, Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Oh, okay. We do have some stragglers here. Um, okay. <laughs> we were there. Uh, enforcement issue. Um, I was just checking in with everyone. Um, we right now don't have much snow cover. Um, it is frozen conditions. So I just wanted to, to check in on the enforcement order. Um, again, we have a you know, temporary um, stabilization measures that have been um, installed and they can't do a whole lot in terms of removal of the sediment until the ground thaws. But um, just checking in because we have sort of um, no snowpack at the moment. Um, and if if folks want to wait until um, things start to thaw out a little bit um, in the next couple weeks or 
um, in the next month, or if you're um, feeling like you're eager to get out there, either way, I can um, go in one direction or another. I just didn't want you to think that I'd forgotten about it because I haven't. Hmm. Thanks, Erin. Is there, so I, the movement of sediment down that hill is pretty visible and it's probably just frozen in time at this point. Is there, what is the benefit or the cost or whatever to waiting for the ground to thaw or, you know, what do we lose by not going out while it's, or going out while it's frozen? Um, so they've, they've put um, a temporary cover of wood chips over the, the sediment okay. um, and over the, the material that was, um, the work area that was uh, where work was done that was outside of the scope of the original project. Um, so they've, they've temporarily stabilized it. Um, it's you, you essentially, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see um, because it just looks like a covering of wood chips, but obviously um, underneath the wood chips, there's all of the sediment material. So um, I think it's just, I mean, that's basically the site conditions at the current time. Um, all that material is going to have to come out, but I know that there were some concerns about um, uh, what the sort of long range um, response of the commission was going to be to this enforcement order in terms of requiring them to restore the site, potential, um, you know, stabilization measures and or potential mitigation that would be required to compensate for the violation. So that might give the commission some insight into what those requirements might be. Um, if the commission got boots on the ground, but I can't guarantee it's not going to snow again next week or, you know, even by uh, the, you know, I, I'm just not sure what the site conditions are going to look like in the next few weeks. Got it. Thanks. Go ahead, Alex. So what's your recommendation? <laughs> um, I mean, I guess since we're sort of at an impasse right now and it's late in the night that we, my recommendation would be that we wait until the 28th and maybe the commission could think about it now and then and we could, um, between now and then, and we could see what the conditions look like on the 28th and potentially schedule a time. It's probably going to start warming up in the next um, six weeks. So I don't think much is going to be lost if we wait a little while. Okay, so you're saying that we should consider it for our next round of site visits for the next like meeting date? Potentially. So we have um, we're going to be rescheduling the the meeting for Karen Construction. So I could piggyback it on to the um, Karen Construction site visit, or if you're feeling like you'd rather get out there, um, you know, after things thaw out a little bit, I can we can put it off and um, do it after that that meeting i'm i'm kind of at an impasse myself if that's not clear to everyone <laughs> i'm not really yeah. sure um I, i'm enforcement is not my um favorite and so i have a tendency to um you know unless we have a, a clear path forward um I, I think that waiting is not a bad approach to see what the conditions are like on the site but i think it's really a matter of discretion of the commission so from what I understand, you know, there is this erosion problem and now it's covered with wood chips. So which nothing has happened in terms of rain or any precipitation events that would have made anything visible past that. So my inclination would be to wait for it to thaw out a bit so we can like see how the site's moving and how it's looking rather than just sort of frozen wood chips on frozen grounds where we can't actually see what happened. I mean, am I reading that site condition correctly? that's kind of my inclination as well yeah okay any any thoughts comments commissioners questions so moved <laughs> i agree i agree all right so kick the can <laughs> um to a um more vernal situation okay sounds like a good plan all right thank you all right that's it right yes okay Looking for a motion to it. There are two members of the public still. I want to check if they have any comment before we close. Thanks, Bruce. Please raise your hand if you have a comment. Seeing none. I move to adjourn. A second. Based on the motion, Alex, on the second, Bruce. Aye. 
Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Good work, guys. Nice to see you, Laura. Nice to see you. Happy guys. Valentine's Day. That's right. <laughs> I have to admit, when I looked when I looked at the PowerPoint and I said, God, we only got one one project to work on. Everything else is continued. And I said it would be an early night. <laughs> and well, I, it still is. If there's a you know, nature hates a vacuum, we will fill it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think we covered some important things today. So we did fill it well. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night, guys. Bye. Bye.